Welcome to Sheboygan County Government Working For You. And today the focus is on the Transportation Department. And our guest today is uh, Transportation Director Greg Schnell. Welcome, Greg. Thanks for having me, Roger. And uh, I'm Roger T. Strudy, and uh, we don't have Adam Payne with us today, but uh, he's, he's got some time off, so you'll see him the next time around. And uh, this time of the year, again, we start to think about uh, driving the roads as they become a, a real adventure when we come into winter. We've been real good so far, but that can change in, a, in an instant. So uh, why don't you talk about some of the roles and responsibilities of, of your department and, um, and maybe start with, uh, start with that and then we'll ask you a couple questions. Sure. Well, thanks again for having me at it, Rogers. It's great to explain our situation and what we have to deal with, whether it's summer or, or winter. We have, uh, those are the two seasons that we deal with. It's either we're working on construction and doing roads or we're working in the winter. Um, like you said, fortunately this year, we haven't had much to deal with as far as snow, but we've had a little different change this year with some more frost and we're anticipating some more of that um, as we get into the weekend when the temperatures are gonna start to warm up again. So we're all doing a little anti-icing and trying to protect and give ourselves a little bit more time right now. And uh, tell us about the primary seasons and, and how it changes around and like you say if some, it's construction or winter and uh, what, how do you gear up for it and what do you do go, going into winter? Well, most of our construction equipment, our, our trucks and stuff, we, we use those in the winter to uh, plow our snow, obviously. We mount them up with plows, wings, and sanders. Um, but in the summer, we use those as well for hauling gravel, aggregate, and, and our helping out in our construction projects. So we, they're dual use. Um, our plans and our, our operation goes into effect for winter. Um, usually around July, we have to have our, our salt orders in, sometimes even earlier than that, so that we can figure out what we're going to have to have and what, what we need for, uh, for, for the year coming up. And sometimes uh, we have to have a crystal ball in order to, to uh, know what we're going to need. So that kind of starts our, 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 our winter progress in July, and we kind of forget about it for a while, and all of a sudden it gets to about September, October, and we start to think, well, at any given time, um, conditions can change. So we have to start taking some of those, those pieces of equipment, the trucks, and uh, get them ready for the winter months, and that's um, putting on the plows, wings, and sanders and converting them back into that type of operation. And you have a, a variety of trucks, so why don't you explain some of the costs on some of these larger trucks. It's, uh, it's kind of staggering when you get the numbers on those. We have, uh, we, we, like you said, we do have three different sizes that, that, are, that are utilized more often. There's a single axle truck, which ranges about $200,000, $225,000. Then we go to a quad axle truck, which is um, probably about two seventy five, dollars and then we can, or that's a tri-axle, and then go to a quad axle, we're about $300,000. And when I say $300,000, that's completely mounted up with the computerized sanders, uh, wings, plows, underbody, and then um, the salter in the back as well. So when you see one of those trucks coming down the road with the operator, you're looking at well over $100 an hour on regular time when that truck is fully mounted and plowing mm -hmm. snow. And um, we often see the uh, snow plows, we're glad to see them, but um, some people uh, really aren't aware of the issues with safety and everything. How can they uh, be safer drivers and help everybody be safer when they do see a plow? Always give them their, their space. Um, if you can't see the operator in his mirror, he can't see you. So when you're at an intersection and, and you come up behind a, a plow truck, keep your distance back. If you can see just out of the side of your windshield and you can look up at his, uh, up at his um, uh, mirror on the side of the truck and see the operator, that means that he'll be able to see you. But if you're up too close behind him, that's gonna be, make it a little bit more difficult for him because at any di given intersection, there's, a, there's opportunity for them to be backing up and trying to clean up that intersection. If they can't see you, there's a good chance that there's gonna be a little bit of an issue. The same, and at the same token, when they're up on the interstate or any other road, you'd like to make, make sure you give them their space. And that distance is at, at the minimum of 200 feet you should stay behind a snowplow. And there's actually a law that, that uh, prohibits you to be following any closer than that. Mm -hmm. And I, I've um, been serving on the county board for a number of years. I had served before on the town board. Very familiar with the county operations and I appreciate uh, the work you do. and. I don't realize, think somebody real, some people realize how much the other municipalities of the county rely on the county to do their work. You mentioned the cost of a, a large piece of equipment. As some of these townships and villages 
if they don't have to buy that large equipment to plow the snow, you know, the sharing of the expense of that large piece of equipment is very helpful to them. It is. You know, we, um, the state of Wisconsin is unique compared to any other uh, uh, state in the United States. Uh, we have a contract with the state of Wisconsin to plow and maintain their roads summer and winter. Um, that doesn't happen any place else in the United States. The, uh, the state has done numerous studies as far as are they getting the best bang for their buck by contracting with a local municipality in order to take care of their maintenance and it's come out on the positive side um, for a lot of years already. And that same thing is we, we express in Sheboygan County, our, uh, we have 15 townships, 11 of them contract for our services uh, to plow, plow their snow, patch their roads, um, fix their signs. And so it's all based on the fact that we don't have to have redundancy in equipment and all the other stuff where, where we can take care of it for them as long as they can uh, take our services at the time <coughs> that we can provide them, excuse me. And uh, to get an, uh, another snapshot picture, how many miles of road does the county have and responsible for the state, interstate, and local roads? Give us a little picture of that. Sure. We, uh, we have 450 uh, miles of county trunk highway. When I say uh, 450 miles, that's this center line. So you'd have to times that by two. So that's 900 miles. And then you have the state highways. We have about 170 miles of that and 465 miles of township road. So all in all, it's about 2,200 miles uh, of lane miles of road that need to be covered by my 85 or 87 employees. Um, and that's all of us. That's not just the guys that we have in the field. So that 87 includes myself. Um, that we have to take care of. And, and it's, it is, um, depending upon the size of storm, it takes quite a bit of effort to get that done. We send out 45 snow plows for an, a two inch snowstorm. Anything that gets any larger than that, uh, maybe four to five inches, we'll start looking at bringing in some graders. So we have 12 of those at our disposal. And we even kept a few Oshkosh trucks for some insurance if we ever get the big snowstorms again where we need to have uh, something with a little bit more push. We have uh, 12, of those, 12 of those left as well yet. So some of them are getting a little aged, if you will, mm -hmm. but uh, we could put them to use and then we still have the parts to fix them. And the different conditions that come our way need different operations too. Sometimes it's, it's going to be icing up so you spread the salt ahead of time to keep ahead of it. I believe in some other things and maybe some things that some people don't understand. They see some material being sprayed on the bridges. What is the reason that is done for? Well, the, the bridges are the first things that typically ice up and that has to do with um, the pavement temperature. The, the air underneath that bridge is what causes it to, to, to ice up. So if you have a, a bridge and an air, air temperature that's uh, um, somewhere around 32, underneath there it could be a little bit colder. So if there's just a little bit of humidity in the air or uh, a little bit of rain or, or some snow, um, the bridge decks are the first things that go. So we spend a fair amount of effort and time um, spraying down what uh, is called salt brine. It's just water and salt mixed to a certain um, chemical balance so that we don't cause icing by, by placing that. And we, spe we spray about 300,000 gallons of that a year just to protect. And what that does is it provides us with enough time to respond. Uh, we don't run a 24 hour seven operation um, that would bring our full scale of people in. So if we get a call on a weekend that the roads are starting to get slippery or it's starting to snow, it gives us a, a good amount of time to get there and it keeps that snow from bonding uh, right tight to that bridge. One other thing I'd like to suggest and provide some, some um, advice, these first couple snowstorms of the year, uh, I think that we all have to step back and look at things and uh, one of the things that we see the, most of the time is people using their cruise controls in, 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 in the winter months and when those bridge decks, when the, when the regular pavement is, is dry and you hit a bridge deck that has ice on it, that's where we see all, most of our accidents, right at the end of a bridge deck because of the cruise controls. So I would suggest not using that in the winter and keep mm -hmm. that just for a summer operation. And we're a large county. Uh, the areas near the lake have different temperatures sometimes and quite a distance. I'm sure that uh, you have to have your guys out looking and it may be nice in one area but not in the other. How many spots are guys looking at or how many uh, sheds do you have people looking out? We have, um, during, the, during the winter months, we have um, two guys that are on a second shift, we call it, and, a third, and then we have two guys on a third shift. So they're responsible for the overnight hours 
typically just during the week. We also have two superintendents that are, th their responsibility is to check those conditions because if it may be snowing on the north end of the county, but maybe not on the south end, if we make a call to bring everybody in, that could cost the county tens of thousands of dollars by the time it's all said and done just by making one mistake, bringing in 45 guys versus 20 guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are some of the other things that uh, the average viewer might not know that is a challenge uh, they, they see it snowing, it's real nice and fluffy, and then what are the challenges that during the winter you have with, that some people may not know about? Well, the, the, uh, the changing conditions from, you can have uh, the good dry pavement, it could be a, a Sunday afternoon and, and the wind starts to pick up, and you could have dry pavement for you know miles and miles and all of a sudden you crest a hill and you have drifting that could start and that those are the types of things that that uh, we, you know we as drivers need to be prepared for um, over and above just snow operations the, the challenges that that we've been seeing on our roads and and there's been uh, numerous close calls and accidents this past year there's been um, three highway workers killed in our immediate area from distracted drivers people that are maybe uh, um, not paying attention to what they should be on the roads and that has become a bigger bigger challenge for us that um, we'd like to get out to everybody that when you're driving and you're coming through a construction zone you please you got to be aware because these guys are working next to 70 mile an hour traffic and we're within inches of that so we need to have people uh, start to pay attention to what their surroundings are and uh, so my guys can go home to their families and, and enjoy their Christmases and New Year's and birthdays. And we talked quite a bit about the winter operations during the snow plowing, but uh, take us through the rest of the year for us. What would you typically start doing in the, in the spring or maybe even if you have a winter that is not as, uh, as snow filled as sometimes, what can your guys do and what do you have them doing? Over the last couple of years, we've been the, the winter has come in a lot earlier. Last year in November, everything was froze up tight, and we started to receive some snow early on. So we didn't have a good opportunity to take care of a lot of our, our right-of-ways, our brush. Um, now with no snow, we're able to get down in the bottom of the ditches, clean up trees that are in the right-of-way. We need to do those um, in order to protect people from going off the road. If there's a big tree out there, we don't want to pr provide that as, as an area where they could uh, harm themselves. So we need to provide that safety zone. So we're spending a lot of time on, on uh, cleaning up our right-of-ways. We have a tremendous amount of equipment, summer equipment that needs to be prepared. Plus now we're starting to look at, um, right after the first of the year, we'll start looking at um, our fuel. Uh, if we should be purchasing, pre-purchasing all that fuel because of taking advantage of, of good prices now, um, developing our costs, looking at estimates, and really laying out a schedule for what our, our next year's construction projects are going to be. What are some of the projects that you, you finished up in 15 and what do you have planned for going forward into 2016. Okay, we uh, we built a roundabout down at County Trunk A and EE, uh, which was a safety uh, enhancement program that was uh, partly uh, funded by the federal government. We also built a section of road in between um, 28 and EE, so that's uh, that was uh, strictly uh, funded by our locals. Um, we finished up the LS project. We did a, a tremendous amount of municipal, township work, village work this year, um, and we're looking for forward to a very busy 2016 as well. And uh, <clears throat> would, you, uh, would, you, would you explain something about the airport operation? We think of mostly highway as transportation, but we also, part of your role uh, is uh, the, uh, the highway, the airport out at uh, Memorial, Memorial Airport off of uh, 23. You want to explain a little bit of that and, and what goes on there and how much it means to our county? Sure. The, uh, our airport investment is, is, is tremendous. I, I think I've heard numbers that it has um, about, I think it's like $27 million of impact of, of, of what goes in and out of our airport uh, with fuel sales and everything else that it generates by bringing people in and out of our community. Um, we have a beautiful airport. It, 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 uh, we'd like to see it grow and expand. Um, the, the state and, and the FAA share that. They've, they've been very gracious with, with helping us sponsor and pay for some of our projects. Um, we're looking next year at uh, expanding taxiway B. That'll be our construction project for next year. In 2017, we're getting some additional funding to help uh, do some rehabilitation on our concrete runway that we put in a, a few years back. Um, 
just a lot of things happening uh, there too. Is it's a lot of concrete that has to be cleaned up and, and uh, uh, taken care of, uh, plowed around all the hangers. Um, we only have three full-time guys out there to take care of that. So it's uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work inside the fence. Plus we have a ton of acreage on the outside of the fence that needs to be maintained as well. I remember talking to your former airport manager, Chuck Meyer, and he, he explained to me, well, it's, um, it's quite a lot of snow we have to plow. Just imagine a parking lot over a mile long. Yep. So it, it's, you've got to clear it wide, just not a little path. You have to have it clear for if the plane doesn't land right in the center or the wings tip down, you can't have a snowbank catching them. So that's quite an operation and I'm sure you have to de-ice that and all things like that that we're not uh, thinking about. So. Yep, we spend a fair amount of money on chemicals for the de-icing agent. Uh, we can't use abrasives out there because it's very difficult on the, on the jet engines. Uh, but yeah, when you look at a runway, it's 100 feet wide, you know, and that's that's a lot of passes to keep pushing that to the outside. And, and we all know as you're taking that to the side, that snow gets heavier and heavier and bigger and bigger. And then once we get it to the outside, there's lighting out there that the pilots rely on to, to make those safe landings. So then we got to clean around every one of the lights and make sure that that's visible by those pilots. So it's a lot of work to keep that cleaned up. And also there's a, a fence around the entire perimeter because animals, especially deer, is really quite a quite a jolt to a car, but a, a plane it'll spin it around too. That how has that been working? Is is there still a few that sneak in, or every once in a while, our, our fence uh, usually they come around in, in the ditch areas or the creek lines. If all of a sudden the fence gets pushed up with some frost and the poles, and then the, the deer um, they don't need much of a space to crawl through in order to get in. They feel pretty safe inside there. It's funny how they get the <laughs> you know, get to recognize that, but uh, we have uh, to work with the DNR in order to eradicate that, and then we take care of business because we do not want that to be a collision on one of our runways. Mm -hmm. And are there any future projects going on? We had some talk about a terminal. How is that going or what do we have going forward along those lines? The terminal is still something that's it's being considered. We're, uh, we're going through like a feasibility study to make sure that we're doing the right thing and making the right investment for the county. Um, there's a lot of things that come along with the terminal. We have, we have a lot of um, um, exports and imports, different people coming from different countries. So. Uh, we need to be looking at a customs potentially in the future and uh, a place to bring our, our, the transients in, you know. So we, we're, uh, those are all things that are being looked at, but it is something that's in our, in our, on our radar screen for, for the future. And um, thinking about the entire transportation department, what are your long-term challenges and what are you, you looking for that uh, into the future as much as you can, what should be we, do, we be doing and what do you have planned going forward? Well, statistics say that um, we should be, with the amount of miles that we have on our county trunk system, we should be paving about 30 miles a year. Um, we're far from that. We're in that anywhere between 10 to 15 miles a year that we're getting. Um, but besides the paving, we also need to be doing some reconstruction. Some of our roads um, don't have the proper shoulders on that they need, and we're uh, losing, losing some of our roads to drainage issues that should be taken care of. So there's, there's a tremendous amount of balance that has to go into that. So before we invest a lot in pavement, we got to be stepping back and taking a look at the whole cross section of the road and make sure we're making the right investment because water is one of our biggest enemies when it comes to pavement. And, uh Inflation makes everyone's cost go up, but uh, I remember seeing a graph that you showed us, the normal inflation of uh, products and uh, workers throughout the country and compared to the inflation of blacktopping a mile of road. Uh, could you give us a little snapshot of that? I don't remember the statistics, but uh, just to give you the numbers, um, in 2000 and I believe it was six, we were paying like $200 a ton for a liquid ton of asphalt. Um, we were as high as $600 a ton just a year and a half ago. Um, the price is starting to come down a little bit, um, but those are things that are out of our control, which is very difficult for us then to keep up with that 30 miles of pavement. Mm -hmm. And no different than the county, the townships, and the state as well. I mean, that everybody suffers from those high costs that is done on a global market versus what we can do locally. And if someone's wondering why don't they blacktop my road, what is a mile of road cost, say an average road, which is 22, 24 feet wide? About $120,000 to overlay that. $120,000 and a few years ago it was 
60 and 40. I'm, I'm yep. getting to be an old guy, but I remember <laughs> when it was that low, and it's way above the net, the increased cost of normal inflation. That's, you're, that's you're, the thing. You're 100% correct. It, it has gone up uh, tremendously, and hopefully the way things are going now, it starts to come down, but uh, I, I don't uh, foresee that too much lower. And uh, we recently bought some land in the town of Plymouth, uh, going forward with uh, the buildings and such, uh, would you explain the long-range plan on the building and how we could better serve the county? Sure. We had bought um, 37 acres on the intersection of uh, 67 and County Trunk J. Um, that, was, that site will be utilized for um, the first phase of our project will be combining the Elkhart Lake and uh, Plymouth facility. Our Elkhart Lake shed is one of our uh, five outlying sheds. Um, that was built in 1947. Um, the Plymouth shed was is about 32 years old. So we thought if we got we found a common ground in between there, we don't lose any of our serviceability to the areas we take care of. We would bring those two sheds together at that location. As we were going through that discussion um, for the last 10 years, for sure, and I'm sure longer. There was always uh, some motivation to move our main facility, which is down on 23rd Street in the city of Sheboygan, out to the central part of the county as well. So what our plan is to be is this the, would be second phase, was bring, is bringing our, our main facility and combining all three into one footprint versus being spread out um, in, in the three different locations that they are now. So we'll be looking, I would hope by 2018-19 uh, that our whole facility, maybe 20, we'd be all built, new facility, our new shop, new administration building would all be located in, on the intersection of County Trunk J and 67. And some people are thinking, how will that affect my service? Do we have coverage throughout the county by that overall plan? Correct. We, uh, we, still, have our, we still have a shed on the south side right off of I-43. We have a shed in Cascade. We'll have a shed on the north side up by Plymouth, so we'll be located in all four corners of the county. So we, our footprint is we can still respond to everybody's area and, and provide them the same service as they're getting today, if not better. And one of the added uh, benefits would be that uh, that uh, service area that you have in Sheboygan would be more centrally located to bring the equipment in and get repaired. And I believe you said the, uh, the black topping and Gravel operations is relatively close to that plant also. We do have a pit that's uh, located right behind Road America, the racetrack that uh, we, we haul a tremendous amount of gravel out of. Our, our asphalt plant is located in Greenbush, which isn't far away from there. Um, so yes, we're gonna gain some benefits like that. A lot of people don't understand that, you know, the, our, our out, out facilities, our outbuildings, um, are not for maintenance. So all of the maintenance on those trucks, whether it's blade changes, oil changes, uh, major repairs, the clutches, all that happens on a Sheboygan. So everybody's got to come to the furthest east part of our county in order to get work done. So yes, we're going to gain some efficiencies by being relocated. Well, that, that can benefit everybody and um, we try to, uh, well, I, I'm thinking of a, about a time not that long ago, maybe a couple months ago, we had uh, heads of local government, which is uh, all of the uh, uh, village and uh, village presidents, the town chairman, and the mayors of the county sit together and share uh, some of our problems and hopefully we have common solutions. You were there and you heard them explain that one of their biggest issues that they all had was a few of them had to buy a couple new fire trucks, but other than that, keeping up with the black topping and the improvement of their roads. So that's a common problem we all have and just about all of them had great things to say about your your crew and how they're able to get a, a, some of the best price available for black topping so that's that's a great thing we have about five minutes left Do you want to explain some of the things that you can do and have done with the black topping plant to make it is run as cheaply and uh, keep the product cost down as much as we can? I'd love to. We, um, the, the Sheboygan County had a um, had an interest in, in, the, in keeping that asphalt plant going for several years and that is a benefit to all of us as taxpayers whether you live in the town of Sherman, town of Holland, wherever it is, having that asphalt plant here helps control the cost of, of buying that product outside. But we've added a bag house which helps us meet our emissions. That sucks the dust out of some of the gravel or the, the, the aggregates that go into the asphalt. Um, so it's not emitted 
it into the air. We've also bought um, uh, a recycled asphalt operation where we can recycle asphalt that we pull off the road, run it back through the plant, take out, excrete all the oils that are in there, as well as the aggregates so we can lessen the cost of our asphalt per ton. Um, last year we added the, um, the LP tank, which we're starting to fire with LP versus diesel. We saved ourselves a tremendous amount of money by, by making that addition. So if we continue to make improvements like that and continue to run an efficient operation, we should be able to keep that operation going for a long time. We have a long-term contract with um, uh, where, our where our asphalt plant is set now for the aggregates, which uh, helps reduce our cost for trucking in materials. So we're in very good shape that way. Okay. We, have, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, are there any other things you want to explain to the public that maybe they might, might not understand what the what the county highway department does and is part of your operation that goes unnoticed and uh, they're not aware of the, the many things you do? Well, I, we went through quite a few of them already today, but we do have a full service construction operation where we build our own roads. Now we have our we have an asphalt plant, which I just explained. Um, so we have control of what we can put out there for materials. And uh, we have a crushing operation, so we take care of our own aggregates. And then what builds off of that is we also take care of all the maintenance. Uh, we have to have a, a rubber crack filling crew and we have to have a concrete crew because we take care of so many different aspects, whether it's concrete, asphalt, curb and gutter, um, bridges. Uh, bridges is a, is a big operation. Plus we have a, a surveyor, a survey and engineer office that helps us design the roads and also provides uh, the background for all the permitting and stuff that we need to take care of with the DNR. So we are a full service operation, which not a lot of counties have that anymore. Um, and then that's when you start to lose control of the finances and, and you're paying out a lot more than what you're getting in return. So um, <clears throat> we have a great thing going and I'd like to keep it that way. It's, it's a nice operation. I have a very, very good staff and I just appreciate the, the, the support that I get from the county board and, and administrator Payne. Well, thank you very much for being here and explaining some of the operation and uh, thank you for all the great work you and your crew do. Thank you. And uh, our next week's guest will be um, Rochelle Valeski, the uh, Rocky Knoll administrator. So uh, uh, thanks again for listening to us and and the next time around, Adam Payne will be here with, with me. I'm Roger T. Strudy, County Board Chairman. Thank you.